Thank you for joining us for the program on Harnessing AI for Education. I'm Maron Sahami, the chair of the CS department at Stanford University. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Sal Khan, who is our main speaker today. Uh, Sal is the founder and CEO of Khan Academy, as many of you know. It's a nonprofit organization with a mission to provide free world-class education to anyone, anywhere. And they've partnered with over 500 school districts and schools across the country to make that vision come true. There is more than 150 million registered users for Khan Academy, and they provide their lessons in more than 50 languages, and it's used in more than 190 countries. Sal is also the founder of the Khan Lab School in Mountain View, California, which is a nonprofit laboratory school, and also the co founder of Schoolhouse World, a nonprofit that offers free tutoring over Zoom. If that weren't enough, he's also co founder of Khan World School, a nonprofit new online high school. Sal's interest in, in education began while he was an undergraduate at MIT, where he started by developing math software for students with ADHD. And he was also a tutor for fourth and seventh graders in public schools. He taught MCAT prep and was actually designated as teacher of the year by a large national prep, prep company. And he holds three degrees from MIT, and if that weren't enough, also an MBA from Harvard Business School. Without further ado, Sal Khan. Thanks, thanks so much, Mehran. Um, so I think a lot of y'all know a little bit about the context of how Khan Academy started, but I'll review it all again because I think it's very relevant to this next stage, I think the journey that we're all going through with uh, generative AI. So if you see the slide, the, the, if you show the slide here, uh, you'll see a picture of my family, and this is, or some of my family, and this is an interesting picture because uh, if, I presented at Aspen many times, and many of y'all know, all of Khan Academy got started with back in 2004, uh, came out of, I had just gotten married, my 12-year-old cousin at the time, Nadia, uh, was attending the wedding, I found, it out, I found out that she needed help with math, I offered to tutor her remotely, I started tutoring her, I was in Boston, she was in New Orleans, where I, where I was also born and raised, and um, long story short, it worked out with Nadia, she went from being for lack of a better word, a remedial student to being an advanced student. I started tutoring her younger brothers. Uh, and word spreads in my family, free tutoring is going on. And before I know it, I'm tutoring 10, 15 cousins, family, friends, uh, et cetera. That was back in 2004. Now, the reason why I show this picture is a lot of people ask about what happened to Nadia. Uh, this is a picture of actually the first three students of Khan Academy. If we show it, Nadia is the one that's... So this is a picture of... Nadia is in between me and my wife there, and then those two tall guys are her younger brothers, and then those other three kids are my kids. And it's a fun picture because Nadia and her brothers are now almost exactly the same age that I was when I started tutoring them, and my kids are almost exactly the same age that they were uh, when I started tutoring them. And just as a little bit of a side, I think like all parents, I, my daughter does not love getting tutoring from me. And so I called uh, Ali, who's uh, the middle one uh, there right next to me in the picture, and I'm like, payback time, Ali. And so he's now tutoring my 12-year-old uh, daughter uh, twice a week. So there, there is a way that it comes back. But the reason why I, I, I show this is pretty much my entire journey since 2004, since when I started tutoring my cousins, is just thinking about how do I scale up the tutoring process. Uh, and that's a big deal, because if we look here, uh, in 1984, there was, I, I think people always intuitively knew that one-on-one -on -one tutoring is really powerful. It allows for personalization. If a student is stuck, they can get personalized help. If, if it takes them a little more time to learn something, you can do that. If they're ready to move on, you can move on. And most of human history, those few who got an education got a good one. If you were uh, Alexander the Great, you had Aristotle as your personal tutor, and he would adapt, I'm sure, to what the future uh, emperor was, was going to need. And in 1984, uh, the education psychologist Benjamin Bloom quantified this, and he put it in this, in this paper, which he called the Two Sigma Problem. And I'll talk in a second why he calls it a problem, but in a domain that he showed, he said, okay, if you start with a traditional bell curve, that's that, you know, you can see there it says conventional, that bell curve right over there, at least in, in what he, in the framework he did, he said, if you are able to give someone one-on-one -on -one tutoring in a mastery framework where give students as much time and they need to learn things, you don't just keep moving on even if students have gaps, 
that you can actually get a two, a two standard deviation improvement. And for those of y'all who might be a little bit, you know, foggy on your statistics, two standard deviation is a very, very big deal. It would take an average student and then put them well into the top decile of students. It would essentially take that distribution of students, that conventional distribution, and get into that, that one all the way to the right, that he has that tutorial one-to-one -one distribution. Now, you might say, well, that's pretty exciting. Why does he call it a problem? Why does he call it the two sigma problem? Well, he says, well, there's no resources. In, in a class of 30 kids, how do you give every student one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring? And a lot, and then he said, well, maybe, and this was back in 1984 that he published this, he said, well, maybe there's ways to approximate one-on-one -on -one tutoring using technology. Um, and using some very primitive technology. And folks have debated how large this effect is. Is it one standard deviation, two standard deviations, half a standard deviation? But pretty much every study since then has shown this directionally, um, this happening. But he argued, and he had some data in that study, that using mastery learning with an online system, he could get to one standard deviation. And that's that middle distribution there. And to a certain degree, my initial vector, line of attack, so to speak, for Khan Academy, as I, I'm tutoring 17, um, 15 cousins, I start writing software for them so they can get practice at their own time and pace. A friend suggested I make YouTube videos, which a lot of folks associate with Khan Academy. Another way for me to further get a little bit closer to this ideal. And then since then, as you all know, Khan Academy is now much more than me. We've, as was introduced, millions of folks are using us. We've had 50 plus efficacy studies. And there's pretty good evidence that even before we, we even start to talk about generative AI, we're getting pretty close to that first distribution that Benjamin Bloom talked about, that mastery learning one, that one standard deviation, which even that's a pretty big deal. That would take someone who's in the 50th percentile well into the 85th, 86th percentile, something like that. And um, those studies, you know, what's been exciting is they've all been saying the same thing. The students are able to do about 30 to 60 minutes a week. They're growing by 30, 40 percent more than they otherwise would have. And what's been really exciting, literally in the last couple of weeks, before I even talk about generative AI, two things have happened. Uh, we have a, a series of studies with 200,000 students, and we just had our second year. And one of the things with these large-scale education studies, it's always hard to understand how much of that is a correlation versus causality. But because we have two years of data now on the same students, we're able to compare the students to themselves. And what we're seeing is, is students who spent, for every hour extra they're spending this year relative to last year, they're growing by a 50th of a standard deviation per hour more. And for every hour less, their growth has slowed by a 50th of a standard deviation. And a 50th of a standard deviation doesn't sound like a lot, but that's per hour. And so you can imagine over a school year, if a student keeps up with it, they can easily start to do this. And that's a pretty, we think, airtight causal argument that just reinforces what Benjamin Bloom was trying to tell us back in 1984. The other thing that we wonder about is, okay, it's one thing to have the efficacy studies, but how do you actually get into a real mainstream, mainstream school district and how to actually make it happen? And one of the things I'm very excited about is Newark, New Jersey, which I don't think anyone would argue is some special case school district. It has all of the problems and all of the opportunities that almost any large urban school district has. They started using Khan Academy, the North Ward of Newark, it's about a third of the school district, started using it pretty intensely in November. So they got a late start. And as of last week when the school year ended, 70% of the North Ward of Newark, New Jersey has had usage that should get students at least to that first standard deviation. So hold us accountable. In the coming weeks or months, you should be hearing data, not just an efficacy study, but a whole scale movement of a large urban school district, which you frankly haven't heard much of. Now, with that said, it's nice if we can get to that first distribution. That by itself would be a big deal in education. But what if we could get to that, that other one, what if we could really get that much better at emulating what a human tutor could do? And so now enter into generative AI. So my question for y'all, how many of y'all are scared of generative AI? Just generally, you're just scared of it. Okay, good, you're honest. How many are excited? Oh, a lot of people. How many are confused, not sure? Okay, good, all right. So those of y'all who are afraid, especially in the education space, you're not alone. You know, these are the headlines that we've all been seeing ever since November when ChatGPT came out school systems banning chat GPT, rightfully thinking, well, students could use this to cheat, write their essays, do their homework, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'm gonna show you is, and, and just a little bit of background, um, we, we had access, you know, chat GPT is built on GPT 3.5. We had access to GPT 4 starting at the end of last summer. 
And so we were behind the scenes working on this. And at first when ChatGPT came out, I, I remember messaging the OpenAI folks. I'm like, hey, I thought we were under NDA. It's like, we haven't launched anything. This is just a chat interface on stuff that's already been out there. And I was worried because I was like, wow, this ChatGPT wasn't built for education. It has no safeguards there. People have this knee-jerk reaction. They're going to judge this before they even have a chance to see what's possible. But then I'm actually, in hindsight, glad it happened because it allowed people to process that even though ChatGPT was, is and was very imperfect, it still had a lot of opportunity, and they could kind of get through that first phase. And then when we were able to launch in March, and I'm going to show you what we launched, I think there was much more receptivity to thinking about, OK, can you solve the problem now around cheating? Can we use this for good? And so what I'm going to show you is what we launched on March 15th. It, our AI on Khan Academy is called Khanmigo. And um, it, it tries to address a lot of the main issues while also trying to aspire to that two standard deviation improvement. So what you see here is just a traditional exercise on Khan Academy, but what's new here is that little uh, AI bot at the bottom. And so if we click on it, you immediately will see some things. First of all, some guardrails. The conversation is recorded and viewable by your teacher. But if the student says, tell me the answer, so say the student wants to cheat, says, as your friendly AI tutor, conmigo, I'm here to help you learn and understand the problem, not just give you the answer. Let's work on this. What do you think the next step should be to solve this equation? Let's say the student does it, but does it wrong. They distribute incorrectly. I see that you tried to simplify the equation, but I'm curious how you got to that answer, uh, how you got to your step. Can you explain your thought process? Remember, we need to distribute the negative 2 to both the, the 9 and the 2m. So there's some very interesting things that are going on here. As you can see, not only is it actually able to di diagnose the math error, and I won't claim that it's perfect, and this is something that we're continuing to work more and more on, and it, it actually even knows that it's imperfect. That's why it says, can you explain your reasoning to just to make sure that it got it right? But this is very different than what you see even if you were to go straight to chat GPT or GPT-4. Um, there's a lot of work to just get the AI working, and I'm happy to to, to talk about that in the, in the Q&A that we'll have in a few moments. The other thing is, y'all might notice that this is really acting like a, not even an average tutor, I would say an above average or a good tutor, where it's not just giving the answer, it's asking leading questions, it's doing pedagogically sound things like asking the student to explain their reasoning. And once the student explains the reasoning, that's where these AI, uh, that's where large language models are really powerful, can actually understand uh, what the student is saying. Now, other safeguards that are in place, I mentioned that it's monitored by parents and teachers, but also we have a second AI that's monitoring the conversation. And if the conversation goes anywhere shady, kids want to do self-harm or they're doing something hateful or misusing it, then parents and teachers are actively notified, and then the AI won't engage in that part, that thread of the conversation. So once again, we're trying to mitigate the risks, but maximize the benefit, one of which is, hey, if we can scale what Sal did for Navia, to maybe many, many, many more folks. But it's not just in math. This is in computer programming. And as we all know, you know, math we need to improve, but in most schools in the country, there isn't even someone who can teach computer programming. But here, I would argue that this is actually a better tutor than I am. Um, and, and it's because it understands the code. It's infinitely patient. So here's an example where a student's trying to get the clouds to part. This is on Khan Academy. And they type one variable in there that makes the left cloud part, but then they're like, well, you know, why, why is only the, the left cloud moving? And so this is, you know, even when my kids ask me for help, it takes me a little while to figure out what their code is saying. It says, great observation, in your current code, you have that variable inside the draw function. Uh, to make the right cloud move as well, try adding a line of code inside the draw function that increments the right x variable. So it's helping me, not giving me the answer, not writing the code for me, but helping me. And if my, one of my kids came to me with the same problem, it would have taken me five, 10 minutes just to even understand what's going on there, much less be able to help them. And, and that's coming from someone who, who has a background, much less if you're in an environment where, where there aren't folks who, who can do that. But it can work on pretty much anything. Here a student can say, like, why do I need to learn this? They're learning about the scale of, of molecules. And the AI can say, well, what do you care about? So once again, it's keeping it Socratic. And in this case, the student says, I want to be a professional athlete. And so the AI will say, awesome. As a professional athlete, understanding the science of sizes can help you appreciate how your body works at a cellular level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So once again, answering some of the age-old questions that, that oftentimes will show up in a classroom.
Now, it's one thing to see this, this demo, and this is live. Y'all can, in, in theory, have access to Conmigo you know, today. Um, but let's hear some real students in real schools, and it's no coincidence, I told you about Newark, New Jersey, we've been very impressed with what their leadership's been able to implement. So when we launched this in March, we said, hey, one of the first places we want to try this out is Newark, New Jersey. So let's hear from some of the students on what they think about Conmigo. It, it knows a summary, it knows many different things, and it knows Spanish, Portuguese, and English, and it knows it's really smart, but it doesn't know everything. And here's another young man. It just helped me out with it. It didn't give me the answer, but it helped me out get the answer. I feel like he's like a tutor, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, a non expense paid tutor. Like, when, when you're on it, it didn't, like it, like Audrey said, it didn't give you the answers straight away, but um, it like guides you through, it's like guides you through the work to like make it more fun. So it's like a little person sitting next to you, like telling you how to do the problem. So what I've just covered, and you know, this is real kids in real classrooms that's starting to happen. And you know, right now we have about 10,000 folks using it. This coming back to school, we can talk more about it, but it's going to start going into the tens of thousands. And I think by this time next year, we're going to be talking about the hundreds of thousands of kids in real classrooms and real teachers using it. Um, and I'll talk more about the teacher use case, which honestly could be just as powerful. But everything I've shown you so far about the tutor use case is kind of like what I was doing with Nadia. But we realize that there's things that you could do that even to some degree transcend what a, what a good human tutor could do. Uh, here's an activity we have on Conmigo where um, you can ch chat with literary characters. And so in this case, they want to talk to Eeyore the donkey. Oh, hello there. It's me, Eeyore. Not that anyone would notice. But since you're here, what would you like to talk about? Just remember on a May I simulation. And the student asks, why are you so pessimistic? And then let's see what Eeyore, Eeyore says. Well, now, isn't that a question? I suppose it's just my nature, you see. Some donkeys are born with a sunny disposition. Others, well, we see the thistles more than the roses. But that's life, isn't it? We, all can't, we, all, we can't all be tiggers bouncing about. Now, what about you? Do you find yourself more of a tigger or an Eeyore in your own life? So once again, not only is it able to take on these personas, but it's able to drive the conversation. And just so you know, some of what's going on behind here actually is an expert in cognitive behavioral therapy as well. That just happens to be uh, Eeyore. Uh, but you could talk to simulations of historic characters, et cetera, which we're already getting a lot of feedback. It's a really powerful way to dig into history, dig into literature, um, et cetera. We can also, students can practice debate uh, with the AI. Here, um, a student is debating whether to cancel uh, government debt. Uh, and the student can take one side of the debate. The AI can take the other side of the debate. And we've already gotten strong feedback, especially from high school students, that they love being able to debate in a safe environment, no fear of judgment. They can practice arguments. They can take both sides. It's helping them fine tune their communication skills and makes them uh, overall more confident. And we're also experimenting with the AI actually moderating debates between multiple students, which is going to be uh, interesting as well. Now, this next thing I'm showing you, we haven't launched yet. It's going to come out hopefully in a, in a few weeks. But it directly addresses the core fear around ChatGPT, which is it's going to undermine writing as a way to, for students to learn and to assess their understanding. It's, that somehow it's going to undermine the, the term paper. Uh, what you see here is on the left-hand side, students can write an essay. And on the right-hand side, so, you know, if any of y'all have used Google Docs, if, you have, if you're collaborating with someone, it can highlight parts of your document and start these little back and forth threads where you can debate, hey, do we really want to use this word? Or maybe we could argue this better. We are now doing essentially the same thing, but now any student has an AI on demand who's expert in what you're trying to write. So this is an example of a student, where, and this one's going to be specialized for uh, writing your college essays. It's not going to write it for you. It's going to write it with you. Uh, but if the student asks for feedback, so here the student can first say, you know, I want uh, feedback on structure. It can highlight that. You start with a vivid scene to land the reader in your story. But then it makes sense to step back and tell the stories that happened to you. And then the student can keep chatting with it and say how. A student can look at their arguments. And here it highlighted and said, I would suggest giving a little bit more attention to how exactly Steve inspired you and changed your life. And so once again, this is, I think, a major leveler of the playing field. 
Many folks know college admissions, folks can pay thousands of dollars for consultants, coaches to give feedback. If you go to a good private school, you're gonna get a better guidance counselor to help you out here. Now every student can essentially have expert coaching around, uh, around their essay. And there's another really interesting dimension on this is we're gonna make this possible so that any teacher can assign written activities through Conmigo Student can come here, work on their work with Conmigo, and then Conmigo can report back to the teacher, not just on the final output, but also the process of how they got there. And we think that's going to be a major way of essentially undermining cheating. If someone just went to chat GPT and had it write something and just copied and pasted it, Conmigo will tell the teachers, like, I wanted to work with him, but he just copied and pasted something. We should double check what, what this is. Or maybe, if you want to, I can quiz them and see if, if, if they, they understand what they just wrote. But the directive to most students is like, no, work with the AI. This AI is going to help you with the essay writing process. Create an outline, build your arguments, get your data, and then make a, and then make a solid argument. Now, everything I've talked about so far has been students, equally powerful for teachers, so uh, this, is a, uh, this is a history exercise on Khan Academy. And you know, like we said before, if a student does it, if we start on student mode, and I'll, we'll click on uh, Conmigo there. So we start in student mode. If we say, tell me the answer, the AI, once again, will not tell the answer. But then, this is a teacher's account. They can switch into teacher mode. So then it acts as a teacher guide. And now if you say, tell the answer, it will literally tell the answer, but even more, it's, you know, teachers can say, can I, can I develop a lesson hook around this? Can I create a lesson plan? Can you make it relevant to my students, to my city, to the sports they care about, whatever? And so now it can help create lesson plans. And this is a really, really big deal. Teachers right now spend 10, 15, 20 hours a week grading papers, writing progress reports, doing lesson planning. If we can use AI to turn that 15 hours a week into an hour and a half a week, more energy for teachers for themselves. We know that burnout's a big problem right now and a lot more time for their students. And you're going to have better, more engaging lessons because this, this is like having a really powerful teaching assistant. And once again, you can hear it from me, but we can also hear from some of the teachers in Newark. The buy-in is so important. Like, student engagement is the key to education. So if the students are able to ask the personalized questions and give it gives um, an answer that's relevant to them. They're gonna feel more empowered to do the work and feel inspired to, you know, try to learn these things that otherwise they might say, what's the point? I think Khan Academy is kind of, you know, leading us through that safe path of, you know, let's support the kids, let's manage it, let's uh, control it, let's um, monitor it and make it safe so that then we can, you know, allow the educational world to look at how can this really impact education and how can it make it better? So, you know, as you, you can imagine, it, it's probably obvious that, you know, in this whole, the AI debates that are going on of like, should we be afraid of it? Should we be excited about it? At least in the education lane, you know, I am worried about what's gonna happen for authoritarian governments monitoring their people with generative AI. I am worried about what fraud and phishing attacks are gonna look like with generative AI. But at least in the education lane, I've never been more optimistic. Uh, you know, I think we can actually now talk about the two sigma problem as an actual two sigma opportunity. And what you're seeing, what I just showed you, a lot of that would have looked like science fiction a year ago, and that's just the very, very, very tip of the iceberg. You know, this is just a list of some of the stuff that we're working on as we speak, and we want to you know, supercharge as much as possible. Giving the AI memory, it's taking notes on the student, it can share that with the teacher, um, it, can, it can do the assignments to the teacher, all of the writing stuff we talked about. It can, always, you know, it can personalize and tone even more. It works in every language. Uh, we're gonna add both speech to text and text to speech where you can have a conversation with the AI. We're starting to work with APIs where you can make sense of images, where you can just point your camera at something and have your tutor all around. It's like if, Alex, if Aristotle was always just following Alexander. And it's like, well, what, why is that tree growing faster than that tree? Take a picture. The AI can actually in, engage in a conversation with you about it. So all of this um, would have seemed science fiction a year ago. I've always, you know, there's this book. I don't know, how many of you have read Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson? All right, there's a few. Uh, so, so it was written in, I think it was 1994, so it was ahead of their time. It's about, a, it's kind of a not too far off future in a neo-Victorian China where there's a member of the nobility who commissions an AI-based tablet app to tutor his, his, his granddaughter. This app gets pirated and it gets in the hands of like several hundred thousand orphan girls who live on barges and then they just take over the world. 
And uh, the app in that book is called The Young Ladies Illustrated Primer. And from the early days of Khan Academy, every new employee, I used to hand, you, got, you know, they get used to get a free copy of the Diamond Age, and I used to say, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime, and we're going to constantly work towards it, but I want Khan Academy to eventually be the young lady's illustrated primer. Something that anyone, ideally you have a teacher, you have a classroom, but if you don't, even with that, you can essentially uh, tap, in, hap, tap into your potential, because if we do that, um, I think hum if we can work on the, the core issue of human potential and human intelligence using artificial intelligence, then I have a lot more confidence that we as a society are going to be able to tackle all of the other issues uh, that artificial intelligence is going to throw at us. Thank you. Great. That's fantastic work. Um, we're going to have a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, in just a little bit. But I wanted to start off on a historical note, actually. So I was, you know, reviewed or read your book, The One World Schoolhouse, years ago. It's about 10 years old now, and looked over it again on the plane on the way here. Um, and so I wanted to start with this historical note. One of the things you recount in this book is a story of Ann Doerr sending you text messages from here saying that Bill Gates was talking about you on stage. And so if you think about you know, where you were, that would have been, what, like 14 years ago, something like that? That was 2000, it was summer of 2010. It was at Aspen Ideas, so it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's 13 years ago. So when you think about that evolution, what were the values when you started Khan Academy? So you told the story about Nadia, your cousin. What were the values that when you got inspired to do this were the things that were important to you that when you thought about what this could be, and how has that played out in the last decade? I, I, in hindsight, and it is in hindsight, because you, know, you oftentimes say, well, should we still be doing this or that? Um, I think there's a couple. I, I, I think it was a blessing that it started with me working with my cousins. It kind of lowered the stress of doing it, and it allowed me to be myself in the videos. Uh, and I think, you know, in hindsight, all the teachers that you always connected with are the ones that brought their, their lives into the classroom, told you when they were stressed, told you if they were not feeling good, or, you know, cracked some eccentric jokes. And, I think that personality, that humanity that was in the early Khan Academy, uh, that's something that I've really held on to and you know, sometimes frustrated other team members um, because sometimes, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to scale that. Uh, but that is one value that, look, at the end of the day, you, there's a lot of folks who can create education resources and textbooks, and we all know, but they all feel, they all feel dead in a certain way. Um, and usually because they're made by group committees of experts, all of them who are afraid to actually show vulnerability. Um, they want to check off standards, and you know, we check off standards too, but it's more that we give the intuition that people feel connected to it, they feel de-stressed, that every now and then they might chuckle while experiencing Khan Academy, wh whether it's a video or not. Um, and so, you know, coming to generative AI, that value, you see it in ConMigo. Um, I've actually been amazed by some of the other applications out there, how little effort they've put in giving the AI an approachable personality, something that you would want to spend time with. So I think that's one value. I think the other values are around personalization, mastery learning. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we used to say like, hey, no one should be giving lectures anymore. It was like sacrilege. Um, and this notion that if a student hasn't learned the material yet, mm -hmm. they should get more chances to learn the material. And if you have to slow down, that's okay. I mean, it's hard if you have 30 kids in a room, but now you have technology, you can do that. And over the years, there are a lot of like, well, that's not what the market wants. You know, teachers want less than aligned practice, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we've, we've found ways to, to thread that needle where we can give, we can meet teachers in classrooms where they are today, but then nudge them along so that we can get more to this, you know, personalized mastery learning. I would say the other thing in the early days of Khan Academy, there was a, I, if people could tell, I read a lot of science fiction, and another book I was very inspired by was the Foundation series, Isaac Asimov, where you know, he tries to prevent, prevent the dark ages of the gal or he tries to shorten a future dark ages for a galaxy by collecting all of the galaxy's information in a foundation. Sure. And when I'm in my more megalomaniacal moments, I'm like, what if Khan Academy is the foundation? And you know, hopefully we can prevent the dark ages or we can, bring, we can help bring society to a point that will make today look like a dark ages. Uh, you know, some folks, you know, Anne's here, that, you know, knows that I have a theory that benevolent aliens are using Khan Academy to prepare humanity for first contact. Um, <laughs> and actually, that Bill Gates story that you mentioned, that was one of my key data points. I'm like, this, there's no way that this happens without benevolent alien intervention. <laughs> but um, I, I, think, I think, yeah, I think that, that focus on personalization, mastery, whimsy, and then swinging for the fences, um, I think has been stuff that I've, I've held dear. 
Well, I think that's really interesting that you talk about humanity as being one of the core values. Because then when you, because some people think of part of the fear around AI is that we're losing our humanity by using something that's technical in as intimate a context as educating children. And so when you think about that, I mean, people bring up concerns and we can go through some of these, you know, and then we'll talk about broader issues. But one of the concerns is about the accuracy of the information that's generated. So when students interact with the information, how do you try to mitigate inaccurate information or when you, is there, are there ways you detect it or there are ways you mitigate it? How do you think about that? Yes. So it's, yeah, you know, the way generative AI is working, I think most folks are familiar with this. Left to their own devices, they can hallucinate. That is literally the, the technical term for when they, they'll make up things. There are certain things that they're more likely to make up than others. Like if you were to ask them for like a, a URL, they'll oftentimes, if just the raw AI, it'll just like make up a URL um, or, or sometimes data and things like that. So we've been working very hard to mitigate that pretty dramatically. Um, one, GPT-4 is dramatically better than GPT-3, so the models are getting better and better themselves. We were involved in some of the fine-tuned training of the underlying model around some of these math and these um, tutoring use cases. But then above and beyond that, on our layer, one, many of the interactions you saw, they're anchored on Khan Academy content, whether it's an exercise or a video. And the exercises behind the scenes actually have the solution there. So to some degree, we're giving a teacher's guide to the AI as well. So that lowers the error rate pretty significantly. And then we also introduced, and this was a, a researcher at OpenAI who encouraged this. And it is amazing how strong a metaphor it is between the human mind and, and the the, the AI, which is, if, I, if I'm tutoring you and you've just done a pretty complicated algebraic problem, I won't immediately start talking. If I immediately start talking, I'll probably make a mistake. What I will probably do as a good tutor is say, hmm, let's see, how would I have approached that problem? Hmm, 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 hmm. hmm, I got something different than you. Like, that's, that's what a, a good human tutor would do. Sure. And so we said, well, what if we let the AI do the same thing? So we kind of this notion of an AI thought, which is if there's any math, especially, because that's where math it's infamously not good at, it first decides what it thinks would have been reasonable responses from the student. Then it uses that to compare to what the student said. And if it's different, it won't outright say, I'm right, you're wrong. It's saying, hmm, I got something different than you. Can you explain your reasoning? And then, when the, and which is pedagogically the right thing to do. That's what a good tutor would do. And then when the student explains the reasoning, the AI, you know, nine times out of 10, the AI is right. And the AI says, um, well, well, you know, that second step, think about why you did that. But one time out of 10, if the AI is wrong, it's like, oh, you got me. You actually did do it right. And it's actually humble about that. And it's one of these weird things where, We've actually gotten feedback from students that they really like that. They really like that it's, it feels, it almost makes it feel more human mm -hmm. uh, uh, than not. So, so that's that. Um, but when you use it in, let's say, less anchored contexts, and we do have a few less anchored contexts I just showed in that demo, um, I think it's one, it's really important for students to just have digital literacy about it. And I always point out, this is not a new, a new notion. If you were to just go do a web search right now, the first five things you're going to see are ads that no one has really vetted for accuracy. And then the next five things you're gonna see are people who are just good at search engine optimization and not necessarily the most, the most uh, valid. And then if you go onto social media or you go to you know, YouTube, then those pre-large you know, language model AIs, they are all optimized around giving you the thing that's most likely to, for you to watch more ads or stick around longer and unfortunately, those are the things that tend to be triggering. Those are the things that tend to make you, that lower your self-esteem. Those are the things that often have intentional misinformation. So this, is, this problem already exists. Um, I, I'm actually, I, I won't say that it, it clearly exists also with the AI, but I actually am more hopeful about being able to mitigate them on AI mm -hmm. than being able to, you know, than what's going on in social media and, and other things. Well, it's an interesting guard, guardrail that you talk about, because most people, if they had an experience with something like ChatGPT, they were kind of doing unstructured or unbounded sort of information tests, right? And there was this series of articles in the New York Times from Kevin Roos where he's just like pushing it and pushing it until it goes to this place where it's telling him to leave his wife and all these <laughs> kinds of things, which hopefully doesn't happen with, with fourth graders. Um, but what I'm wondering, I mean, it sounds like you're saying on the back end, you've, you've created a guardrail or a constraint to say, we're talking about this lesson. What happens if the student tries to go off lesson? Do you just not allow that to happen? So, it, and, and we've done a lot of experimenti experimenting and prompting to try to, to try to let the student go enough off, but, but still bring them back. So if they're doing it while they're doing a video or an exercise, 
a student could say, why does this matter? Why is this relevant? You might end up talking about football a little bit, but it will try to bring you back. Mm -hmm. But you know, we have the view that, look, if a student is genuinely curious about how this might connect to that and that stimulates another, we should entertain that type of curiosity. In fact, the, the current school system doesn't afford space for that. Now a curious student, they can keep asking why, when, how. I mean, that's, that's part of the beauty of it. But yes, we do try to keep bringing it back. And if the, if it does what a, a thoughtful tutor or teacher would do, if the, if the student just does something non sequitur or clearly is just goofing around, the AI would say, come on, let's be serious. <laughs> and, and let's come, come back to the, the subject. Interesting. So you got, it sounds like there's some engineering that's going on that's specific yes. to the educational context. So I want to hit on the point that I imagine is on a bunch of people's mind, which is kind of the biggie, and you alluded to it, which is around the use of generative AI for, for cheating in education. And just some of the stats recently, there was a survey by study.com found that 25% of teachers reported that they'd already found students cheating with using ChatGPT. Turnitin, which is a, a site basically that does plagiarism detection, said that close to 10% of submissions had at least at least 20% of the writing was AI, and about 3.5% were 80% to 100% AI. So when you think about, I mean, these are kind of the, the darker reaches, right, of thinking about the use of generative AI. How do you think about that, both in terms of the context of Khan Academy, but also in the broader context of education generally? Yeah, it's a real thing. Um, so I think out the gate, uh, if, if let's put Khan Migo aside for a second, if I was running a university or a school, a K-12 school, I would, chat GPT has forced the issue of either you're going to create assignments where you say, go ahead, use chat GPT, but now I expect more of it, I want you to create a prototype, whatever. And some, you know, Ethan Malik at UPenn has been, you know, talking a lot about doing things like that. And that works for, you know, Wharton students or whatever. Or do a lot more in class. Like, hey, we're going to use this class right now, you have an hour, right. And turn it in. And you know, unfortunately that does lose the traditional, hey, you have a week or two that we all grew up with. Go write your paper, write an essay, write a book report type of thing. And that's what we were trying to solve with, you know, what I showed earlier today, which is what if students can do that within a safe environment? And what a teacher gets a report on is not just the finished product, but can actually talk to the AI about the process that got them there. And the teacher can also look at the audit trail of how the student did it, what was the whole conversation with the AI, and if the essay just shows up there, both the teacher and the AI can be suspicious about it and either say, no, I want you to do the process with the AI. You can't just copy and paste something or even, you know, you can quiz that student about it, et cetera. And then, not only does that help mitigate cheating, but students can get multiple rounds of feedback before they even turn something in which is good, that's mastery learning, it's very hard to do traditionally, it's very expensive. And then teachers, you know, God bless them, you could imagine if you, if, you, if you teach three English classes, each of them just submitted, you know, 30 essays on whatever, on the, you know, the scarlet letter, that's pretty mind-numbing work to read like 90 essays by, you know, seventh graders on the scarlet letter. Um, the AI can give you a first pass. Uh, I won't say it'll grade for you, but it'll give you a first pass, but you can work and create a rubric with the AI, and it's very good at that, and then have the AI apply that rubric to the student's work, and then teachers are gonna be able to save a lot of time and actually probably give much more consistent uh, feedback and grading. Sure. I mean, this brings up an interesting point because um, there's a couple questions I'm going to skip over in the interest of time, but when you mentioned thinking about having the AI work in tandem with the teacher for some sort of assessment. So the EU just created this AI framework, right, where they think about a risks-based approach to, to uh, regulating AI. And one of the things that they actually talk about is AI used in an assessment tool being in the high-risk category, mm -hmm. right, which means it should either be heavily regulated or it should be banned. Do you think they got it right? Do you think they got it wrong? How do you sort of see that assessment? I, the way, and you know, assessment is a very broad thing. You know, there's the traditional assessments, which we might think about like SAT or like you know, end of year state exams, but assessment goes all the way to things like assessments for job interviews, et cetera, et cetera. I think it is a space where you have to be very thoughtful about it. I, am, I definitely don't think you should ban it because the way I, assessments are already biased and depending on what type of assessment you look at, and they're actually very hard to audit the bias in them. But now, like, you know, one of the things that the EU talked about is resume screening. They said no use of AI for resume screening because it could be biased. It's good intention where they're coming from, but do you know what like, also could be biased? The head of HR who's just looking at resumes and spending three seconds per resume looking at it. And it's much easier to audit an AI than to audit the, the, uh, the, your head of HR. For the AI, you can test it. You could create canonical examples of like, you could actually ask the AI, create five resumes identical to this but use different ethnic names, use different ages, use different genders, 
and then see if the AI creates a similar signal for all five of these resumes that are otherwise equivalent. Mm -hmm. That is auditable. Right now, humans just looking through it is very much not all. And there's all sorts of studies. If you get interviewed at the end of the day versus the morning, of, you know, it could be a completely different outcome of, of your career. Within companies, the most inconsistent thing is the hiring process. If you get someone who likes you, likes the way you're dressed, went to school with you, it's going to be a good interview. You get someone who had, you know, has a stomach ache, it's going to be a bad interview. Um, so I, I'm not saying that this is going to be like a silver bullet, but I do think it should, be, it, it should be seriously looked at. And I think the first frontier is actually going to be not that the AI just does an oral exam, an oral defense, which I think it will eventually be able to do, but we are looking at ways that the traditional assessments, they're all multiple choice. Why? Well, that's the only way to scalably grade things, multiple choice assessments. But now you could do free response. And if you do free response, because everything was multiple choice, writing got taken out of education system, and that's why most kids can't write now. But if you can bring a little bit of writing back, and I think the AI can actually robustly assess short form writing, especially if you tell it what good answers would have looked like, and you should test it and all of that, then I think it actually can be a, a, a big gift. So I, 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 I would be scared to just immediately knee-jerk do it. I think you have to see when it's happening. Are we auditing? Is it an improvement over what we have? Nothing's ever going to be perfect, but it's all relative to what you already have. I think that's an excellent point, is that, that uh, comparison with what's already mm -hmm. there. Um, when you talked about resume screening, for example, as one of those uh, examples, um, there's this famous case with Amazon where they had a resume screening tool. They found it to have gender bias. They audited the algorithm, and much to their credit, they actually said, we can't get the bias out of the algorithm, and they stopped mm -hmm. using the algorithm. When you think about an educational context, when generative models are, are generating text, right, there, there could be encoded biases in there. Right? Kind of the classic one is doctors tend to be men, mm -hmm. nurses tend to be women, um, both gender bias, racial biases. Is that something you've audited? Is that something you looked at? Or how do you think that will play out in the long run in education? Yeah, I mean, you could imagine we, we've done um, ourselves and some of our partners, and we've been working with several partners now, um, it's in everyone's incentive to do what, you know, what's called in the field like you know, red hat testing. And red hat testing, you go onto a piece of software and you act like a bad actor, or you try to get it to say the worst possible things. And I, I, I would say that between the models themselves and the people who are generating, it's, it's there, I mean, they know that this is a potential issue. So they are working very hard for it to not show these, these types of biases, and then we are as well. So we're asking really hard questions, stuff that honestly a lot of teachers would struggle keeping a, a, a fairly fair take on, on those types of issues. Um, but, you know, it's out there, and, you know, thousands, millions of people are going to use it, and we know that Anytime something shady, we're going to get a screenshot, and it's going to show up on social media. It's going to show up. There's going to be much more transparency of this than, I mean, it's great that Amazon recognized the bias, the gender bias, and they stopped using that AI, but I'm guessing a lot of their engineers have gender bias too. And there's, they've never, you know, it's hard for them to audit it, and those folks are going to keep interviewing or not go through, you know, more training, et cetera. Yeah, I agree. It's harder to cut open someone's head and try to identify yes. the bias than it is to yes. look at the weights of an algorithm. Yes. So one final question before we open it up to the audience. When you think about the long-term potential, one of the things people also talk about is AI broadly, not just generative AI, but is going to have winners and losers. There's going to be different sectors of the job market, for example, that are impacted in differential ways. Um, that's also true for education. Students that get access, I mean, these are great tools. And as you show, talking about Benjamin Bloom's paper, right, if you can push kids further along on that curve, Curve, they get better outcomes for their careers, for their lives. So how do you think about what's the access plan? How does this look like to open up access to everyone so we don't create more of a digital divide? Yeah, I, that's front and center for us. Uh, you know, even with pre-AI, I mean, that's why Khan Academy exists as a not-for-profit. Our mission is free world-class education. AI has introduced, at least in the medium term, an issue here. Because, you know, Khan Academy itself, it costs many tens of millions to build, but then the incremental cost when someone comes, it's, you know, it's, it's a website, so it's fractions of a penny. Generative AI, not only does it cost tens of millions of dollars to build, but the token, you know, for those of you who don't know, I mean, each of these requests that you see, they're going to like thousands of like state-of-the-art NVIDIA processors and then coming back. It is very computationally intensive. And so just the cost of computation is on the order of, let's call it $10 per user per month. Um, and so that's a further barrier. So, you know, before you had to get internet access, you had to get a device, you had to have a context that could support you in doing that. And now generative AI is going to cost another $10 per student per year. Now, I would make an argument, even in the near term, even at that cost, 
you know, New York City spends $40,000 per student per year. Even the lower funding states spend about $10,000 per student per year, arguably at least a, a fifth to a third of that's on math education. And if this can actually move you a standard deviation or two, mm -hmm. where all else has failed, it's probably worth it. Um, but on top of that, we think that the costs are going to come down pretty dramatically. Uh, the costs of GPT 3.5 have come down by a, a, a factor of 20 over the last year. Uh, so we are definitely you know, nagging the various people who create these various models about when their costs can come down. Um, so if it, it, a year from now, I'm hoping that we're talking about it so it's almost free. Um, and, then we'll, we'll get, and then it's just about getting it in the hands. And honestly, at that point, I think it's just going to be teachers want to use it, district leaders want to use it. I think what honestly is where we've seen the biggest frictions has been in, I would call it kind of the district regulatory environment, where they create these like well-intentioned internal regulations around student privacy and this and that, but then it unintentionally makes it very hard to adopt certain technologies, even though they know, oh, wait, the way you're using it is fine. That's good. But they've already put that thing in place. And so that's why, once again, it's very, people have to be very careful about the regulations. Sure. And it seems like there's lots of opportunities there for public-private partnerships. Yeah. Um, we want to open it up, too, to questions from the audience. I imagine there's a lot firsthand up there in the ideas cap, blue shirt. <clears throat> First of all, thank you. Brilliant, brilliant what you've done, and congratulations. Two questions, if I may. The interactive portion where the AI queries the student, uh, does that have to be programmed, or is a lot of that part of a large language model? And the second question is, what about AI for the softer skills like athletics, dance, art? Fascinating. So on the first one, I mean, that's that's the... I mean, what I call is the magic of what the, the, you know, the generative AI we're now seeing, I, I honestly didn't think it was going to happen in my lifetime. And it's happening now. And it's accelerating. Um, and so what we do on our side is we give it, we give it the instructions. We tell it, like, you're, an, you're a tutor like this. You're whimsical. You're fun. You, you know, we've, we've even used some, like, um, examples from movies of, like, you are a tutor like this person. Um, and, you know, if a student, you don't give the answer and, you know, never tell a student they're wrong, ask them to explain the reasoning. So we give that level of constraint, but you give it that and then it's able to, it's able to dynamically, you know, be somewhat um, creative in, in how it engages. Um, in terms of the non-academic, so we already do have activities. Uh, we have one that's a career and academic coach where it can have a conversation with a student. A student can say, help me, I'm how do I get over procrastination? Or how can I get over test-taking anxiety? And we're working with some leading uh, education psychologists around best practices, cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera, and it runs the intervention um, the way that you would do it. So like, you know, the, I was just showing a demo earlier today about the, about the procrastination one, and it says, okay, so tell, tell us about things that you don't procrastinate and tell us about things that you do procrastinate. And you answer, and it's like, okay, so what's different? And it, so it, 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 it really, it does a kind of a science-based intervention with you. So we, we have stuff like that. It has stuff like guidance counselor type stuff. Uh, you know, we, we've been talking to folks like Angela Duckworth around, you know, um, around character and social emotional learning and all, like how can you develop those things. Um, what's interesting about dance or athletics, right now we don't, I mean maybe certain quasi-academic portions of it we can handle, but the, you know, even though they're called large language models, um, there are already API, APIs out that we're experimenting with that have both language and visual combined. So you can pass an image to it and have a conversation about the image. And not only, it can understand the image. You can give it a drawing. Like uh, someone drew a picture of like an anvil from a, a like just a, a hand-drawn thing. And then there's a lever here like that's like this. And then there's a little weight here. And then there's a bell. It's just hand-drawn. It's like, you know, just we would draw it on a napkin. And you ask the AI, what, what's in the picture? And they're like, oh, it looks like there's an anvil with a lever and, a, and there's a, a bowling ball and there's a belt. But then you can say, what happens if I cut the rope? And it'll say, oh, well, then the lever's going to fall down, hit the lever, the other side lever, the bowling ball's going to hit the bell, and the bell's going to ring. So that exists today. And so it's all about putting that in a context that's actually useful for people. And so I could imagine, well, one, students just doing their work. It can actually see the student's work and make sense of whether they're doing that properly. I can imagine, and this is probably six months to a year out, not far, where we can ask students to draw how they're feeling and talk, we can, we can, the AI can have a conversation about that. 
we can have um, a student uh, take a video of themselves dancing or trying to, you know, taking free throws, and it gives them feedback, potentially. I, I, you know, we haven't tried that out, but it, it does not sound implausible anymore. Another question. Uh, way in the back over there. Thank you. Uh, I just have, I guess, a bit of a compound question in that a, l a lot of times as we think about scale in education and then early days and conversations around AI as it pertains to scale in ed, we tend to yada yada the fact that even though one to one is good, not all ones are good ones for the ones. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that speaks to differentiation, that speaks to cultural alignment relevance speaks to any number of things, right? Um, so I just wonder from a model perspective, um, how are you or are you seeing the field maybe take that on? Um, and I think the compound piece is considering that within the context of the fact that the uh, breadth of the, probably the designer profiles and the, the, the you know, the, the folks feeding the kind of models, right, early days when we're designing these, because they do start with human beings, probably far more narrow, right? There's probably less proximity to learners. And often, and, and I mean, no disrespect to anybody, I just, I'm just being real, right? So uh, keeping those two things in mind, that there's a need for differentiation and one-on-one learning experience, and you probably have a quite limited uh, spectrum of folks actually crafting the models, what's happening to reconcile some of that? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I think, you know, you know when people talk about cultural re relevance before, gender, like I, I was talking to one of our foundation partners where we were talking about this, and at the end of the day, when you don't have a tool like this, you almost have to make mass generalizations about certain groups of people in order to make it relevant, which in and of itself is almost a problem. Like, okay, maybe a lot of that group of people like you know, this sport or this type of, you know, uh, music, but maybe some of them don't. And maybe some of them like anime, or maybe some of them like, you know, Minecraft or whatever else. And so when, you, you know, I think the problem with some of that is like it, it's almost forced to generalization. What's interesting about this, and as you can see, you know, we, we're trying to get in front of real students as quickly as possible. Um, and we're, you know, Khan Academy is always over anchored on, you know, the reason why we're free world-class education, obviously we want to be used by everyone. It's great if um, Bill Gates' kids are using us, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, that's a signal that even people who can afford other things are still using it. But we're, the reason why we're free is we want to reach students who are histor historically under-resourced, kids in Title I schools, kids that are underrepresented. And so that's why all of the districts that we work with, they overrepresent Title I schools um, in the country. They overrepresent African American and Latino students. And then, you know, a lot of these prompting we're doing alongside these students and these teachers. So yes, we have a team, and, and it's a it's a reasonably diverse team. But even more importantly, we're embedded in places like Newark, New Jersey, working with those teachers, getting direct feedback. And then the AI itself is interesting. So, you know, one of the things we want to add is memory, and part of the memory is the AI itself taking notes on what resonates with that particular student. And so if that student says, hey, you know, I speak Spanish at home, could we do this in kind of a mix of Spanish and English? It'll remember that. And, and it can speak every, literally every mainstream language and some non-mainstream languages. Um, it can speak, and it can speak it in any tone that the student connects with. You know, my, my, my daughter, I thought she was just playing around, and she asked it to speak in Gen Z slang. And at first I'm like, you know, she's messing around, but it actually engaged her dramatically more when it spoke to her in, in that way. And so if we have memory and it always does that, um, then I think we can connect more. I, I mean, you could see when the student said, why do I need to learn this? It didn't assume anything about the student. It says, well, what do you care about? And so it's, it's giving the student the respect. I'm not just going to assume because you're a 12-year-old boy from this community that you like that, which is honestly a lot of what um, you know, some, some education materials. It, it says, I'm going to ask you as a human being, what do you care about? And then I'm going to try to make that relevant to that. Well, we're a little over time, but we'll take one more question just because it seems like there's a huge amount of interest. Um, so right there in the blue sweater. 
Hi, this is my question. So you have it in certain schools at this point, and it helps with um, SATs and getting into colleges in these particular communities. So let's say you have, like I have eight grandchildren living in different areas, um, New York, Brooklyn, the, those are all in private schools. But then I have Chappaqua, which is a great school system. So is my grandson who's looking at colleges right now, is he at a disadvantage because you're not there? Um, and how do I get you there if he is disadvantaged? I, well, we, our goal is to, we want to be in as many communities as possible, especially in disadvantaged communities, ASAP. I have no doubt that many folks here, you know, you're going to be able to go tomorrow and get a Conmigo account for you and for everyone in your family. And uh, it, 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 you know, it is a powerful tool. And if we don't get in the hands of more kids, you're gonna just have growing gaps. I'll tell you, this was about six months ago, I had a conversation with, I won't say which universities, the heads of admissions of two major universities, uh, highly selective universities, and I'm like, we, we were talking about something else, but at the end of our meeting, I'm like, hey, what about what's going on with generative AI? Aren't y'all worried? And both of them, I was actually surprised by their response. They're like, you know what? In some ways, it's kind of putting a spotlight on stuff that's already existed, because we always kind of assume that affluent kids were getting help. And they were. I mean, you know, people in a lot of private schools, it's pretty common for people to pay five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 to hire a college consultant who, in the best cases, will give you feedback, and in the worst cases, it's Varsity Blues, and will fabricate or write your essays for you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and what these heads of admission says, we kind of recognize that that was happening, so that's why we always wanted to keep our essays short, and it's much more about what you're actually doing than what, how you actually write it. But maybe they were, these were both STEM schools, so they were maybe a little bit less indexed on that. But I think it's a really important question. So now this levels that playing field a little bit, um, but it's, you know, in a world where we're test optional right now, the Cal system has essentially banned standardized tests, which my personal opinion, now you're, what are you anchoring on? You're anchoring on essays, you're anchoring on recommendations, you're anchoring on grades. The most great inflation is at private schools. The, the college counselors who know how to write the recommendations and the teachers are, are at private schools. And on the essays, who's hiring the $10,000 coaches? So in the name of equity, they've just removed the most objective piece of the puzzle. Um, so th th those are, so, so that's why, you know, I think these types of tools, the faster we can get it out to more people, the, the better. Well, it seems like there's still more questions, but we're going to have to wrap it up because we're over time. And if there are more questions, please come on down and ask. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you.